Hi, and good morning, everyone, and good afternoon for those uh, on the East Coast. Today is Tuesday, May 5th, and live from Washington, D.C., Venable welcomes you to our webinar, Understanding Federal and State AG Financial Services Enforcement Trends. My name is Jonathan Pompin, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar and one of your speakers. I'm a partner and co-chair of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau Task Force here at Venable. For the next hour, a former U.S. Senator and State Attorney General, a former federal prosecutor, and two industry attorneys in the trenches will take an in-depth look at the priorities at the forefront of government, criminal, and civil enforcement efforts from a regulatory, legislative, and business perspective. During the webinar, our speakers will share their experiences from the front lines and offer strategies to help you navigate the evolving legal landscape. Our webinar today will be recorded, and a downloadable version will be available on our website later today or tomorrow. Today's webinar will be a roundtable discussion. That's right. Rather than have this be a series of lectures or cover information you can already read about online at our website, venable.com backslash CFPB, today's webinar will be interactive among the participants and you. We won't be covering every single enforcement action or repeating what government agencies have already put out in press releases, but instead we'll be offering off-the-cuff observations and analysis that we hope will be insightful and educational. Please follow the on-screen prompts or email me directly at jlpompan at venable.com any questions you have during the course of today's presentation and discussion, and we'll try to work them in as best as possible. We'll do our best to incorporate those questions both periodically and also at the end, so please feel free not to save them until then. Of course, uh, contacting us and asking us any questions um, does not create an attorney-client relationship. Um, but it, the confidentiality of that information, too, uh, will not be preserved either. Of course, also, please don't send us anything specific about your particular business, but keep them generic. And uh, our live attendees, stay tuned to be uh, the very, for the very end today uh, for the CLE code. Um, and that code will be presented again uh, on the very last slide of today's presentation. So now let's get to our all-star panelists. Uh, and uh, get to know everybody here around the table. First up, uh, former U.S. Senator Mark Pryor. Uh, Mark's uh, Venable's, a part of Venable's legislative and government affairs and regulatory practices. Mark? Thank you for uh, having me today, and I look forward to uh, being part of this discussion, and uh, certainly appreciate everyone being uh, in, a, you know, listening in and, and participating, and we'd love to get your questions, so just email those questions to John. Great, and uh, Michael Bresnik, former federal prosecutor. Michael? Yeah, hi. <clears throat> um, my name is Mike Bresnik, and before coming to Venable, I was the executive director of the President's Financial Fraud Enforcement Task Force for two years, working closely with Attorney General Holder, Deputy Attorney General Cole, others throughout the Department of Justice and um, other government agencies who deal with all manners of financial fraud, and uh, including Operation Choke Point. So I'm happy to talk about that today. And uh, Jeff Knowles, uh, not a former government official, but rather the head of our government division here at Venable. Jeff? Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, delighted to be here today. Obviously, uh, like you, I'm on the defense side of things and have been defending companies uh, that have been under investigation or enforcement actions by the FTC, Department of Justice, CFPB, and State Attorney Generals. And uh, myself, uh, Jonathan Popan, um, my practice consists of representing clients before the CFPB, Federal Trade Commission, and State AGs, and as Jeff mentioned, not only on the defense side, but also on the compliance side, too. And uh, certainly being in the trenches and uh, occasionally up against the uh, folks that uh, Michael and Senator Pryor used to work with, um, gives us a different perspective, but I think Jeff will be able to offer certainly some color commentary from the, the client side of things. So uh, today's topics are going to include uh, a variety of uh, subject matter, uh, an overview of consumer protection working group uh, as a combat consumer fraud, um, and then of course we're going to talk a lot about coordination amongst the individual government agencies. And Michael, you're no stranger to that. You really actually were the, the lead coordinator at, point, at a point in time between the Department of Justice, the CFPB, the Federal Trade Commission, and the banking agencies, as well as some outreach, I guess, to states. Um, and uh, Senator Pryor, you'll certainly be able to give us some reference points for how states react to that level of coordination. I know some have been very active participants and others uh, perhaps a little bit less, but nonetheless, on the consumer protection side, it's usually not a question of what party you're on, but uh, what, what happened to the consumer. 
Um, and then, of course, we're going to talk a lot about the practical impact of uh, what has been uh, referred to as Operation Choke Point and related activities. I guess there's, Michael will probably get into this a little later. There's Operation Choke Point and there's Operation like Operation Choke Point. Uh, there's sort of, the, sort of both varieties out there, but a lot of folks uh, looking at uh, sort of central hubs of activity uh, on the enforcement side. And then we'll transition to compliance best practices. We know a lot of folks on the phone listening in today and participating later are going to be on the compliance side of the house. And so we want to talk a lot about what one can do, uh, not just as an industry uh, to those that are part of trade associations, but for those that are part of companies what you can do now um, to avoid scrutiny or to at least mitigate scrutiny if there is. And that's going to depend, of course, where you are on the chain of commerce as well as also what role you play uh, with other relationships uh, that you might have. And then, of course, we'll talk about ways to minimize that government scrutiny altogether. So uh, first up, um, you know, Michael, uh, the Consumer Protection Working Group launched in, in 2012. Um, you know, several years ago, the president initiated this. I think it was part of originally uh, sort of a State of the Union address and then uh, it sort of blossomed from there. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what that working group was about? Where, where did it start? Yeah, actually, um, Jonathan, this particular working group of the Financial Fraud Enforcement Task Force began or at least had its inception at a time before I even started as the executive director. When I was interviewing for the job, I remember talking to uh, Deputy Attorney General Cole and he was asking me at the time, uh, at the time that the task force had a number of different working groups, including securities and commodities fraud, mortgage fraud, TARP-related fraud, fair lending uh, issues. But it had, what I saw, was a little bit of a vacuum in the area of consumer protection. There wasn't a group that was focused solely on the area of consumer protection. So the, the DAG asked me at the time uh, when I was interviewed, and he thought, well, where, you know, where do you see this task force going? What would you do? if you were to come on as executive director. And I, without really, you know, skipping a beat, I said, you know, I'd like to start something in the area of consumer protection. I want to start a consumer protection working group. In particular, I was interested in looking at um, the roles that uh, payment processors play or, or could play in fraud schemes um, committed by uh, their underlying merchants. Because at the time, we had seen the Wachovia case, which had already come out, a number of FTC actions focused on processors, but I wanted a more comprehensive look uh, at this, um, uh, what I perceived to be a national problem at the time and something that we could do something about. So uh, he seemed enthusiastic about it. I got the job. And it wasn't long after that that I started working in, in the Attorney General and collecting a group of leaders for that particular working group. For those of you who aren't aware, the, each working group within the task force has co chairs, and, within the, uh, and underneath the co chairs, there are members of, it, of the group, of each group. So I wanted to put together a group of, of all-stars who would help me uh, fulfill uh, the mission of this particular group. So I got um, David Vladek, who at the time was the head of the Bureau of Consumer Protection at FTC, um, Kent Marcus, who was the uh, Director of Enforcement at the time for CFPB, and I had Tony West, who was leading the DOJ Civil Division, Lanny Brewer, who was leading the Criminal Division, um, and we got uh, State AGs, uh, Lisa Madigan from Illinois, uh, Greg Zeller from Indiana, and Roy Cooper from North Carolina. And we all uh, had our first meeting in February of 2012, and you're, you're looking um, at a press release that, that referred to that meeting. And there, for the first time, we all got together all the various agencies that uh, exist within government uh, to talk about the various issues that uh, affect consumers in so many ways, including payment processors, payday lenders, um, uh, for-profit uh, colleges, uh, service member frauds and, and so on. And so that was, that's where the whole uh, idea began and we took it from there. Now, um, Jeff, uh, in private practice, um, you're no stranger to enforcement activity and investigations, but typically that's driven by a particular actor, not by particular sectors or a, a, a multi-agency federal and state effort. How does this differ from what historically you had seen? Well, uh, Jonathan, it's a difference in approach. Um, I originally got into financial services representing uh, marketers of one kind or another uh, that were using advertising and marketing practices that drew the attention of the Federal Trade Commission uh, and state attorney generals. 
And there are areas like uh, infomercials and direct response television, uh, internet fraud, business opportunity fraud, dietary supplements and health claims and nutraceuticals, uh, billing practices, and more recently, uh, issues around the Restore Online Shoppers Confidence Act and disclosure of material terms and conditions of offers. And the Federal Trade Commission has done a number of industry sweeps over the years where they've focused on uh, an industries writ large um, and either brought enforcement actions, sent warning letters, and the same thing has been true with state attorney generals. And, you know, when you look at the dietary supplement space as an example, um, as those issues have resulted in massive consumer fraud um, and millions and millions of dollars of, of losses sustained by vulnerable consumer groups, um, the focus of the federal government has moved from individual merchants and sort of a whack-a-mole enforcement approach, moving up the chain to payment processors and to banks who in turn are working with these uh, particular merchants. And so the focus has been if we can't stop fraudulent activity and combat mass consumer fraud uh, by going after individual companies, is there a choke point or a way to cut that off? And so the approach now is to move up the, up the chain and try to hold banks and payment processors responsible for the actions of their merchants. And there are really two components to that. One is to try to uh, get the, the financial services industry to exercise greater due diligence at the underwriting stage and greater monitoring, um, but also to hold them responsible if they don't exercise appropriate due diligence. And the remedies now that the Department of Justice, the CFPB, and the FTC are looking at involve literally holding uh, banks and financial services companies uh, liable potentially as guarantors or insurers for the total dollars spent by consumers. Um, so the whole enforcement landscape has changed dramatically. Now, uh, Senator Pryor, um, at the time in 2012, you were representing the people of Arkansas. Um, you'd been doing so for a while at that point. You'd also been the former Attorney General of the State of Arkansas. Um, so you've seen both uh, what can happen to consumers but all, and, and the type of uh, feedback that you were getting uh, from consumers and, and business. But also, uh, you had brought your own set of enforcement actions when you were a state AG. Um, what tipped, what changed in 2012, 2011, that time period where it became sort of standard operating procedure, as Jeff said, to ratchet up uh, the scrutiny? Well, so these are good questions. I, I would say, you know, I'm here today really wearing two hats, uh, as you mentioned, Jonathan. I was a U.S. Senator, but also before that I was Attorney General. And so I did come to the Senate with that Attorney General experience and that background. I, I think the real tipping point was the crash of 07, 08, and 09. I'm going to call it a three-year deal because it went on and on and on, and a lot of people were hurt. And it, and it hit people in different ways. And I know in my Senate office, we heard from people all over the state of Arkansas, all over the country, just like every other senator and congressman did. And, and one of the things you need to remember is whenever you deal with Congress, Congress is much more of a, a reactive body than they are a proactive body. So when there's a crisis, when there's something serious that's taking over all the headlines every day, Congress is going to get in there and do something about it. And I think that right there really may be the tipping point. I, I would say this, that when Mike and his team pulled together this, you know, what I'd call an all-star head of, you know, heads of government agencies he mentioned, you know, folks at DOJ, like head of the Civil Division, the Criminal Division, a, you know, U.S. Attorney presence, an Attorney General presence, the Federal Trade Commission, CFPB, everybody working together, that's exactly what the Congress wanted at that time because, you know, this is a different context, but if you think back to 9-11, and again, very different context, but one of the things that was pounded into the Congress's head over and over and over, hearing after hearing after hearing, study after study after study, was that the federal government is way too siloed or stovepiped. Uh, you know, federal agencies tend to get in their lane and stay in their lane, and they try to do a good job, but they really don't talk to other agencies. They really don't work together. And that's just a kind of a characteristic, a trait of federal government. 
And what we wanted to see then is we wanted to see the agencies come together, like what Mike mentioned a few moments ago, and bring all these agencies together so that they're, they're talking, they're sharing information, they're working together, and they're doing it all to help consumers. And again, these are the people, the American public, American citizens, they're the ones that have been hurt. So Congress was sort of standing on the sidelines cheering them on, saying, yes, we're glad you're doing this. We want you to do this. Now the question is, you know, has it gone too far? Are there new ramifications, maybe unintended consequences? You know, we can talk about those things today or in the future, but I'd say in the context of the time, the Congress was very encouraging to try to uh, get this task force and get these efforts going. Now, now, Michael, in 2011, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau came online, and they, for the most part, were also already taking sort of a market-specific focus or sort of looking at systemic consumer risk in addition to just individual actors. Um, did you have a lot of challenges, though, when you got to the Consumer Protection Working Group to set it up, or were these a lot of things already in motion that you were just pulling together? No, there weren't, there weren't really challenges. You know, when I... To a person, when I approach somebody about either being a leader in that group or participating as a member of the group, everybody was thrilled to be, they thought it was a great idea, they wanted to be involved, they wanted to be a part of it. Or originally, actually, um, Director Cordray was supposed to be one of the working group uh, co-chairs, but uh, he got elevated uh, from the Director of Enforcement to be the Director of the CFPB, so that's when Ken Marcus stepped in on behalf of the CFPB. But, uh, Kent was uh, delighted to participate. Uh, David Gladak and, and all the others that I mentioned were very excited to um, to do this. I know Tony West was particularly excited about it. I think he'd been hoping to do something like, like this for a bit of a for a while. So Jeff, from our perspective, at the time you and I were both here at Venable in private practice, representing individual companies in a variety of matters, a lot of compliance work, and we start to see investigations happening, both of downstream players telemarketers, advertisers, other marketers, and then their service providers, oftentimes payment processors. What was that like? Well, when you go back, you know, we do a lot of work. Uh, you know, as you know, I founded the Electronic Retailing Association. We represent the Direct Marketing Association. Many uh, mass marketers who reach millions of consumers through television, radio, print catalog, and other forms of advertising. And I, the enforcement approach, as I mentioned, was really focused on individual companies, sometimes on industries as a whole, uh, but more often directed at the acts and practices of particular companies. But at times, for example, when you look at the, the world of sweepstakes and promotions, um, I would represented Publishers Clearinghouse, one of a number of sweepstakes companies that were subject to um, broad uh, state enforcement as well as federal enforcement. And you know, at one time, I think all 50 states were investigating Publishers Clearinghouse for their sweepstakes and pro promotional issues. I think the focus began to change when, um, as the Senator said, when the issue came about how you could combat effectively mass consumer fraud. Could you do that through a whack-a-mole approach going after one market at a time? It was incredibly time-intensive, re resource-intensive, uh, and, a, and a slower way to do it. And so looking for a quicker, more expedient, uh, more efficient process to do it. And I think that's where sort of Operation Choke Point came from. Um, I agree with uh, the Senator that uh, the impetus for this was the Great Recession and obviously a desire to protect vulnerable consumers, many of whom were trapped sort of an endless cycle of debt. Um, but obviously, in more recent years, the focus has been on certain industry uh, categories, such as online payday lending uh, and debt collection as two areas, debt relief as another area. And those are specific areas that are an outgrowth of the Great Recession in terms of the focus. So I think the enforcement strategy has really changed and it's moved away. While there's still a, a lot of individual enforcement against individual marketers and advertisers, whether they're in the mortgage industry, whether they're in the credit scoring or credit monitoring industry, whether in the data collection area, uh, regardless of the area, individual enforcement continues. But there are new tools and new resources and new groups like the Consumer Protection Working Group that are looking for ways to sort of move up the chain uh, 
and try to cut off fraud at, 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 the, at the gateway. Yeah, that was one of the criticisms we got uh, for the uh, Operation Choke Point was, well, you know, how, you're going after the banks and the processors, but how come you're not going after the merchants, the bad guys who are, who are actually, you know, stealing the money from the, the poor, you know, grandmother and grandfather whose um, life savings are now gone. Uh, and, you know, the answer to that is, uh, they're do, you know, DOJ was doing both. I mean, they are, they are going after the underlying merchants. But the, in order to be more effective and more efficient, um, you know, we at DOJ at the time were looking at what we call the choke point or the bottleneck um, in the situation, and that's where we saw the banks and the processors, their positions in the schemes were. Now, Michael, we'll get at the uh, Operation Choke Point in just a moment. But before that, um, at the working group itself, there were other activities there. It's not just Operation Choke Point, right? Yeah. What else was the working group working on? What, what might they be working on now? Well, you know, service member fraud was a big issue. Um, I know um, Stuart Dellery, who um, took over for Tony West as the head of the Civil Division, made that a real uh, priority of his. He's now the acting associate attorney general at DOJ, the number three there. But Stuart, would, uh, he made a number of visits to bases. And we, we put together... Um, um, uh, best practices toolkits that we disseminated to all the U.S. attorneys in the country, all the state AGs, and the JAG legal officers, um, where we put together, um, uh, we provided an overview of common scams uh, targeting members of the military, uh, available federal and state laws that address these schemes, um, opportunities for support, and sample legal materials. So we were trying to get, get the word out, basically, about how service members were being defrauded and their families. Uh, so that was something that we were all very proud of. And Lisa Madigan uh, and Greg Zeller and Roy Cooper also were very instrumental in assisting us. Uh, attorney generals. Yes, attorney, state attorney general. Lisa, attorney general Madigan from Illinois and uh, Greg Zeller from Indiana and Roy Cooper from North Carolina were all very active in, in that effort. Um, uh, For-profit colleges uh, and uh, the fraud scams that uh, can be associated with those that industry were also a part of it. Uh, business opportunity schemes and mass marketing telemarketers um, uh, and there were others that off the top of my head I can't recall, but there were a number of efforts that we were um, looking into. And I'll just add to that, Jonathan, you, met, you mentioned sort of focusing on veterans as an area. You know, both the CFPB and the FTC have been looking at that, two cases. Uh, and, you know, one is New Day Financial, which settled recently with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, you know, was a, a provider of mortgages and refinancing uh, to veterans and their families. And also the earlier uh, FTC enforcement action against Mortgage, and mortgage Investors Corporation, which again was a Florida-based mortgage company advertising very heavily to veterans and their families, again, looking on the refinancing side of things. And so, again, there have been very clear enforcement actions there to go after specific companies, you know, that are marketing to veterans and their families. Yeah, we, we saw that in the Senate. Uh, I used to be chair of the Consumer Subcommittee, and we saw this around uh, military bases where, uh, say, for example, payday lenders really flourished around some of these bases. It depends on state law, but, yeah, we, we felt like our servicemen and women were really being taken advantage of. So, again, Congress is going to want to react, but... Let me make this point real quick, Mike, and I'll turn it over to you. But um, one thing, to, two things to remember about the state attorneys general, and, and they've mentioned three of them right here just in this conversation. First is that state AGs are much more nimble than the federal government. Hey, you know, one of the attorney general of any state in the union can walk in the office tomorrow morning at 8 and say, let's sue somebody. And by 5 o'clock, they file the complaint and somebody there's a lawsuit. Okay, that's how quickly they can operate and you know hopefully they do it responsibly but the other thing is that attorneys general by and large what, what they really go for is kind of what this task force goes for they want to change an industry practice so a lot of times they'll you know find a company or a few companies and they'll go after them and again all, pretty much every AG in the country has this uh, consumer protection authority and they'll go after these folks and they'll try to force the industry to change what it's doing. And it, it comes in a lot of different contexts. But it's really the task force that, that you all set up was really, a, a course, a much larger, more organized, more systemic thing with a lot more reach than what any single state attorney general did. But that's really what you guys were trying to do. Well, yeah, it, it included the state AG community. I mean, yeah. it wasn't just a federal task force. It was federal, state, local, um, 
the tribal, I mean, we, we reached out to anyone and everyone that touched on financial fraud, and we wanted to work with everybody that was interested in preventing it. I was going to say, Jonathan, that the, for the way I look, this is sort of an unofficial thing. I didn't see it in the chart of the task force, but I saw the task force as having three primary goals. One was enforcement. Uh, so, you know, when, when there's a, a crime that's been committed or, or a wrong that's been committed, you to address that. Another is prevention and uh, to get out there and talk about, uh, you know, ways that you can avoid becoming victimized by a fraud scam or another. And the third is victim assistance. And um, with respect to victim assistance, the Consumer Protection Working Group was working with the Victims' Rights Committee of the Financial Fraud Enforcement Task Force to um, help victims of mortgage fraud repair, get their credit scores repaired. So we wanted to work with credit rating agencies to help repair the scores of victims of mortgage fraud that saw their scores get lowered as a result of the fraud scheme. So in other words, if you're a homeowner, you stop paying your mortgage because some bad guy is telling you, don't pay it, you know, don't pay the bank, pay me. Um, to, if we could help that person get their scores uh, brought back to the level where it was before they were victimized, um, that's something that we were trying to do when I was there. Now, uh, Michael, the most high-profile work of the working group to date is what's called Operation Choke Point, which I think first came out, I think, in the lingo in a Wall Street Journal article in 2013. But that, that terminology may have been used earlier. Was, was it used earlier internally? Yeah, I, I can't remember. i got to tell you, Jonathan, that, that name, we've referred to this, we've referred to the banks and the processors as the choke point in the problem. Um, it, it just, that's how I, when I gave a speech about this uh, before the Exchequer Club in Washington, D.C. in March of 2013, where I first announced what we were doing, I talk about how the banks and the processors were the choke point or the bottleneck in the problem. Um, you know, I see in the screen here we've got a, we've got a, a memo from uh, Joel uh, Sweet. He's in AUSA in Philadelphia that I work closely with on this effort. Um, and he's got a uh, title, Operation Choke Point. The name had been thrown around there. I don't know that it actually had any sort of official status. Nobody at DOJ ever blessed this as Operation Choke Point. It just kind of, I think it was referred to informally, uh, internally as Operation Choke Point, and then it just kind of that became what it is, sort of like Obamacare, you know? I mean, people refer to the Affordable Care Act as Obamacare now. And you know, there's no getting around it. That's what it's known as. I think, you know, I could start calling this Operation Bottleneck, but it wouldn't do any good because everyone would call it Operation Choke Point. So... So that's sort of like the, you know, the origin of the name. There was no meeting where we got together and decided what to call it. And, now, and that was an initiative uh, primarily out of justice, though, to focus on banks and others, such as payment processors, doing work with what were considered higher risk areas for fraud and money laundering. Is that right? Yeah, well, basically what we wanted to do was to stop the, we wanted the banks and the payment processors that were knowingly allowing uh, fraudulent proceeds to flow through the national banking system to be held liable, whether that was from a high-risk merchant or a merchant in a high-risk industry or a merchant that wasn't in a high-risk industry but that was still committing fraud. We wanted the fraud to stop, and we wanted it to stop at what we saw as the gateway to the national banking system. So, Jeff, you mentioned earlier uh, that, you know, for years you had seen investigations and enforcement actions of, of the underlying activities, telemarketing fraud, work in the small dollar lending space, um, other what became higher risk categories in the Department of Justice parlance. Um, fundamentally, there has to be an underlying legal violation. Is that right? Um, yes, there is a basic violation. For example, if you take the Federal Trade Commission, their uh, authority in this area, you know, Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act, you know, prohibits deceptive acts and practices. And that is a major tool that the FTC uses, along with the FTC's telemarketing sales rule. And that's the one area where the FTC expressly has aiding and abetting authority. So where you have telemarketing involved and other companies are assisting and facilitating the fraudulent conduct, you can not only hold the primary wrongdoer responsible financially in terms of financial relief and injunctive relief, but you can go after those that have aided and abetted or actively facilitated the fraudulent conduct. And the FTC has expanded on that basic aiding and abetting authority, even though they only have it um, under the telemarketing sales rule. They've used other theories, means and instrumentalities, um, and other theories, the common enterprise theory, 
to group a series of actors together into a common scheme or a common enterprise, and that way hold multiple parties responsible as primary actors in a scheme to defraud consumers. So the FTC has been very clever, and it's funny, we talk about Operation Choke Point as if that was something really new and novel. It wasn't, um, because the Federal Trade Commission had been pursuing Operation Choke Point cases long before the FTC, long, excuse me, long before uh, DOJ actually got involved in that. Uh, the Wachovia case was a good example, you know, back in 2008, but what preceded the Department of Justice's and the OCC's involvement in that case was a series of actions that the Federal Trade Commission and state attorney generals had brought against the underlying merchants. And I know that because I represented some of the underlying merchants uh, defending them in the uh, in actions brought by the state AGs and the FTC. And so the FTC, going back as far as 2003, was bringing cases where they were looking to hold payment processors responsible and others responsible. The FTC has always looked at ancillary service providers, particularly advertising agencies and various types of service providers that are integral to a particular marketing scheme. Um, but the twist in financial services is really to go after banks and payment processors and hold them responsible, uh, in addition to hold, you know, going after the primary actors, you know, the marketers uh, themselves. Yeah, there's no doubt the FTC was the leader in this. In fact, I, you know, I, I learned about this from Lois Greisman and Michelle Chu and Mona Gavaka at the FTC. Um, you know, they're the ones that uh, first were, you know, telling me, hey, Mike, you know, you should start paying attention to this area. And the more I talked to them, the more I learned about the industry. And I saw that as something that, okay, this is great, FTC is doing this, DOJ brought one case against Wachovia, what more can we do? And so that was the, that was the whole point of the Consumer Protection Working Group, to bring together all these agencies. And like the Senator said, you know, the government works best when it works together, rather than in isolated, you know, compartmentalized silos. The more you can share information, the more you can talk about other things, the more you can say, hey, you know, look, when you're conducting an examination, maybe if you, if you see this kind of information, you know, you should pay attention to that, high return rates, other evidence of fraud that we could talk about. You know, that's something that we as a government should all be aware of, and, and that's what the, the working group and the task force did. It, it brought together agencies that maybe had been talking, maybe agencies that hadn't been talking quite as well as they should have been talking, and they put a focus on this area. And, and it might not have been new, but it sure did make a splash. Well, and that's really a lot of what the CFPB has picked up on, too. Con Congress said it prior in the Dodd-Frank Act created the CFPB with all of these tools that disparate government agencies had. So the, what Jeff just referred to, the substantial assistance doctrine under the telemarketing sales rule for knew or should have known that somebody was engaged in a bad action related to telemarketing is embedded in the CFPB's uh, enforcement authority for any activity, not just telemarketing. Is that... And yeah, go ahead. Congress gave them one additional uh, unique feature that very few get, and that is the separate funding stream. So right. They're not subject to the funding pressure, the budget pressure that can come from Congress or even the White House for that matter. So. And gave the power to the state AGs to enforce the federal law. Yeah, and the whole idea there is, you know, you have one federal government, and that's important and all that, and it's got has lots of tools, but you have 50 state AGs out there. And those AGs are, you know, theoretically going to be much more responsive to the people in their states. You know, you can call a 1-800 number and talk to some guy at the FTC in Washington, or you can call your local attorney general and probably bump into him at the Rotary Club or something, you know. So, yeah, the, the state AGs, uh, the idea there is to really marshal them in an effort to really help and be, you know, foot soldiers in this effort all over the country. Right. I mean, and for instance, the, there are a number of state AG cases now being brought using the CFPB's enforcement authority. Uh, and some, some are being litigated, as some have been settled, where the states have gotten greater damages, penalties, et cetera, because of the federal, the federal statute. That's right. And, and this is a, a, a tool, a weapon federal government through you know, Dodd-Frank CFPB gave to the state attorney general. It actually is very consistent with the state AG mission, you know, because state attorneys general basically 
were already doing a lot of this kind of stuff. They just did most most of them didn't have the expertise. Some didn't have the statutory authority locally, but they just didn't have the background. Most of them didn't in these really sophisticated financial areas. They just didn't. Now, state of New York, state of California, and a few others did, but you know most states, the other 35 or so, just didn't have it. Now they all have it, and so. You know that's a double-edged sword. You, you got you have a lot of people out there that are enforcing this, uh, as like with anything in our federalism uh, uh, government here, we're going to have some inconsistency. We're going to have some folks that are really really aggressive and others aren't. So uh, we're going to have to work through that. But uh, the state AGs are someone that you definitely have to keep your eye on. Is this having stuff like Operation Choke Point and this additional added authority through Dodd Frank uh, to bring enforcement actions? Is that having a, an effect of causing essentially more multi-state investigations? And yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, the, the, the state attorneys general have always worked in multi-state and multi-district litigation, and they, they goes, that goes way, way back. And again, it's kind of like uh, what Mike said a few moments ago. There's there's just strength in numbers. If it's one thing to have you know Arkansas and Missouri and Minnesota doing something, but when you add California, New York, and Florida, and you know Texas and all that, everybody working together. Then you really have something, and so they they traditionally work together, uh, and uh, they they are still doing that. And you're seeing more of that in this arena now. I mean, uh, Jeff mentioned a few moments ago. Traditionally, the states would come together, all 50 of them, and they might sue, uh, you know, Publishers Clearinghouse. He mentioned that case or other cases like that. But now they're taking it really to the next level. Uh, Mike, uh, Operation Choke Points come under a lot of criticism. Um, in many cases, but a lot of the criticism centers around due process, sort of categori categorically going after entire markets and, um, and, and pressuring banks, other financial institutions to just stop working in, in a particular, what was called a high-risk market, I think, by the FDIC in, in a document they had where they listed out you know, dozens of different uh, categories. Um, is that criticism uh, something that is driven uh, by industry, or is it th the fact of the matter is, is you did pick, they did pick, justice picked whole categories, right, to, to go after. They did not, it wasn't driven by facts, specific investigations of underlying activity, was it? It absolutely was driven by underlying fact specific activity. They weren't going after whole categories of merchants. They, it, it, the criticism is unwarranted, and the reason for that is it was strictly an anti-fraud effort. The subpoenas that DOJ sent out um, at the time, back when I was there, were based on specific evidence that they had obtained, either from their, their own sources or from information that they got from uh, other agencies uh, about questionable activity. I, you know, and, and I can't go into that anymore, but that led to the uh, issuing of subpoenas and then the, they would get returns from the subpoenas and they'd review the documents and then the investigation would take shape from there. They uh, declined uh, or stopped plenty of investigations and others continued. So, for example, the first case that uh, Operation Choke Point um, saw was the case against Four Oaks Bank, and, and Jeff will be uh, more than happy, I'm sure, to talk about that, having represented the bank in that, in that matter. Um, but it, it was not it was not an effort. I mean, I, you know, look, I've heard so much about it, and I'm sort of gotten blue in my face, you know, defending the the uh, law enforcement effort as a whole, I'm not talking about any specific investigation. Um, but uh, I'm sure you'll have some more questions for me about that. <laughs> well, I, what I would say there, uh, Mike, and we've debated this in past panels, both uh, when you were in the government and now, but the uh, fact is that in choke point when the Department of Justice sent out that group of 50 odd subpoenas in early 2013, the, the threshold or the trigger was a 3% ACH return rate on transactions. And there was a focus on those industries or those types of business that generated those high ACH return rates. One of those categories very clearly was online payday lending. Uh, but I know that it wasn't limited to that. There was a, a, an interest in uh, internet fraud, debt relief, other types of businesses. And yet, Choke Point 
I think to some extent became characterized as really an effort to stamp out the online payday lending industry, whether those enterprises were legally uh, compliant or not. Um, and many in the industry felt that there was pressure put on banks and payment processors to drop online payday lenders as a category, and in fact, pressure put by DOJ on uh, banks to drop their relationships with third-party payment processors, regardless of what their merchant portfolio or their customer portfolio looked like. And so I think the story is somewhere in between. Uh, you, you may be half right, but I think you're half wrong as well. <laughs> My boss. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, on that front, um, I think it's a good time to switch gears and talk about compliance, best practices, and strategies to avoid and survive investigations. So, you know, it really depends on where a company is also, too, I think, in, in the chain of commerce. If you're a financial institution providing a service, uh, such as a bank or a third-party processor, th these issues are going to impact you differently. Um, both from a bottom line perspective as well as from a legal perspective than if you're a downstream merchant in any product category, but particularly, for instance, small dollar lending, debt collection, credit repair, and the like. Um, from a service provider standpoint, you know, the CFPB is probably at the forefront of this, although the banking agencies certainly had put this out before, this idea of due diligence. Um, that service providers and folks using service providers have an obligation to basically be looking to their left and looking to their right. Um, Michael, how important is that that companies do that? Well, I think I think to understand sort of what what your roles and obligations are in this industry, whether you are financial institution or you're a third-party payment processor or an ISO you got to look at the cases that have been brought, I think. I mean, you really need to understand in detail the cases that have been brought in this, in this field by DOJ, by FTC, by CFPB, uh, because from there you get an understanding of what those agencies find objectionable. Um, so, for example, if you look at, you know, DOJ just recently filed two matters in Operation Choke Point uh, in March of this year, so just a couple of months ago, one against Commerce West Bank and another against Plaza Bank. Um, and there, you see, so for example, Commerce West, they're, um, the merchants that were doing business through mm -hmm. Commerce West Bank had return rates of approximately 50% for over a year. Now, just to put that in perspective for those in the audience that don't understand the relevance there, the average return rate for bank checks at the time, I think, was less than one-third of 1%. And so we're talking about return rates of over 50%. So that's greater than 150 times the national average going through Commerce West Bank. Uh, the bank, uh, in that instance, had received complaints from customers' banks, the RDFI. Uh, so what, what Commerce West Bank did was they agreed to block transactions to the bank that complained, but continued to allow transactions of consumers at other banks that didn't complain. Um, so the, the allegations in that complaint were, were pretty egregious, and as a matter of fact, I think it's worth noting that DOJ in that case actually named the payment processor, and that, that's an unusual thing. They don't usually put the name of the payment processor that's not the defendant in the matter. So usually you see something like TPPP1, you know, third-party payment processor 1, but in the Commerce West case, they actually named it, which, again, I, I think is a pretty, a pretty aggressive move. Um, in the case um, against Plaza Bank, there you saw that the bank's uh, COO and the chairman of the board of the bank were also undisclosed owners and founders of the payment processor that was uh, doing business through the bank. So a clear conflict of interest there. And I say conflict of interest because what happened was the chief operating officer sent an email to the third party payment processor management of which he was founder um, referring to the processor as his quote master. That's, that's not good. You don't want that if you're, if you're a bank. You don't want that kind of conduct going on in your institution. And the COO also overruled the request to conduct due diligence on the merchants. You saw about another 50% return rate for almost two years. Law enforcement uh, made inquiries of the bank about the processor and the underlying merchants. Um, uh, and on and on and on. I mean, so the allegations are, are pretty bad. So, um, and again, with the FTC, you can go through their cases against uh, Your Money Access, uh, AEC, and IRN. There's a, there are a bunch of them, and I'd be more than happy to, to go through them in detail if you want. But 
I think before you look at your own obligations, you need to understand what's been brought out there. Mm -hmm. Jeff, well, no, that's for financial institutions. Jeff, for downstream merchants, how do they avoid getting caught up in this? Well, I think you have to look at, for example, uh, whether you're on the HCH side or the credit or debit card oh, side, you, you've got to look at the whole acquiring side of the industry and understand the role and responsibility of all the players from you know, the banks, the card brands, all the way down. Um, if you look, for example, at the recent action the CFPB brought against a number of debt collection uh, def defendants, as well as various ISOs dealing with those debt collectors, and then larger payment processors in turn that were working with either payment facilitators or ISOs. When you look at that, this is an area where generally an ounce of prevention is worth many pounds of cure. If you don't understand where the government has been, both state and federal, and I'll come back to that in a minute, then history is doomed to repeat itself. Um, and so any financial institution or any financial services company has to look at its customers or at its merchants and has to see, understand which of those customers or merchants are in a high risk category, meaning that they're gonna be subject to greater scrutiny by any of the federal agencies, law enforcement agencies, or by state attorney generals. The other thing that you can't tell is if you're a company, whether you're a marketer or a merchant, a retail store, or whether you are a bank or a payment processor, you can be hit by a state attorney general. You can be hit by a group like the New York Department of Financial Services by looking at uh, what uh, Lossky has done in New York. You can hit, be hit by the FTC, Department of Justice, CFPB, a bank regulatory agency, and so on. It, there, it's a crowded field and it's a complex landscape. And so you really have to understand where the risk points are where the vulnerabilities are. And that really means that you have to know your customers and you have to know the customers of your customers. And you have to be able to understand and assess the risk associated with each type of customer, each category of customer. And the difficulty is if you take a large bank or a large payment processor, they may have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, in fact, millions of merchants or customers what level of due diligence, you're not giving them a gun and a badge, you're not giving them compulsory due process to conduct these investigations. The government writ large wants you to look at all the red flags, any indication or any indicia of fraud, they want you to investigate. And yet on the transactions, the profitability, a lot of these businesses are low margin businesses. Fractions so of pennies, right? Fractions of pennies, and there aren't the resources. And in order to undertake the level of due diligence that the government's looking for, the costs have to be borne by somebody. They're not going to be borne ultimately by the financial services companies. Those costs are going to be passed along to consumers. And are consumers willing to pay, you know, for the, the privilege of consumer protection? Are they willing to pay the price for that level of consumer protection? Because those costs can and will be passed down. And if banks and payment processors cut off access to various types of merchants or businesses, consumers will have less choice, there'll be less innovation, and there'll be an impact on the American economy. Now, we have a question from an audience member, and if other audience members have questions, please feel free to email them to jlpompan, my last name, at venable.com, and we'll work them in in our last uh, 10 minutes. Uh, first question, though, is, is uh, we are a small merchant who is in a high-risk category. We're afraid our processors can categorically cut us off. What can we do to avoid that risk? It's a very difficult issue because when that issue came up, a senior official at the Department of Justice said, acknowledged uh, in emails that surfaced as part of a congressional investigation that there will be collateral damage. Merchants who are acting legally are legally compliant in a high-risk business will lose their banking or payment processing privileges. They'll lose those services, and there will be collateral damage. I think all that companies can do is to try to police their own practices, make sure that they are legally compliant, and then obviously have backup uh, banking or backup payment processing services available. One of the concerns that we've expressed is that if businesses in the United States can't find banking or payment processing services, they'll either go underground or they'll go offshore. 
and that will make it even more difficult for law enforcement to police those activities. So it's, I think merchants in many cases in high-risk industries are in a very tough place. I know the dietary supplement uh, industry is very concerned about losing their processing services and other industries as well. It's tough, and if you don't have a strong trade association representing your interests, if you don't have the money to lobby Congress or lobby the agencies, you're in a very tough spot. And this has put a number of industries uh, really under the gun and, and made life more difficult. Ultimately, though, I think it's the consumers that are going to bear the costs for, for that uh, uh, in terms of lost convenience, but also higher prices. Michael? Yeah, just drilling down on that a little more. I mean, I think the, you know, I don't know, without knowing more, it's difficult to, to give a specific answer, but I mean, I think if the merchant can take a look at its uh, return rates and, and, and get a sense of that and share that information with, with the processor, with the bank, um, you can share. This is all stuff, by the way, that the, that the bank should be getting from the processor. We should be looking at promotional materials, sales scripts, return rates, um, really anything to help. The bank is required to understand under the Bank Secrecy Act, uh, the, to require to understand not just its customers, but the general merchant base that its processors, customers. Uh, right. I think you hit on something that I think both you and Jeff have hit on something, because working with a lot of merchants in high-risk categories on a variety of compliance issues, and then incidentally as an aspect of that, the payment processing piece, I think what you're both hitting on and we've seen in practice is, is you cannot take for granted, even though they may have the obligation, that the people upstream with, from you in terms of the vendor relationships actually understand your business and can differentiate between a good actor and a bad actor. Um, and the transparency and the ability to educate, essentially, your vendor, if you're a merchant, can be critical. You might want to permit a site visit, you know, share all kinds of information. Look, one of the problems in the Plaza Bank case was that um, the processor admitted to the bank that the merchant, that the problem merchant, could not produce any evidence that its transactions had actually been authorized. No evidence, couldn't do it. Now that's going to be that's a problem. So presumably this merchant can can do something, can can provide some documentation, some evidence that that its that its transactions are lawful. And it's not just the transactions themselves, right? But it's the underlying compliance with applicable law. Yeah. So, for instance, if that's a debt collector, it would be the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. If it is a telemarketer, it's the telemarketing sales rule, Jeff. It's everything related to the business is fair game at this point for potentially being the risky activity. So. Right, and, and that, that's the problem. I think that's the difficulty that financial services companies have. Um, yes, you can look at the obvious red flags that are out there, high, high ACH return rates, high chargeback rates, high levels of customer complaints, complaints that come from an issuing bank to an acquiring bank. So there are things that you can be investigated. But what I see both federal and state law enforcement doing is picking any red flag they can find, uh, a bad BBB rating, the Council of Better Business Bureaus rates businesses. And recently in the, in the case that the CFPB brought against a group of companies, they cited an F, F rating for one merchant. And so... Based on six complaints. Based on six complaints against that merchant. And that became a red flag that, you know, the financial uh, services companies were supposed to take note of. It's very difficult to be able to see the entire landscape, to see everything that a particular merchant might do. Um, and I, I think that there is really a, a, a risk of overreach. I think when the, when the government can build a case around uh, a bank or a payment processor that's in bed with its merchant or its customer and is actively assisting and facilitating the fraud, I think those are appropriate cases for the government to bring under a choke point of theory. But when you're really stretching the facts and you're pulling one or two or three extraneous red flags that really when you look at them together don't mean much, uh, I, I think you really get to overreach in that case. And I think what you have in effect is rulemaking through the litigation or enforcement process, which is really not fair to the industry because it doesn't give them adequate notice of what they're doing, what, what they need to comply with and what they, if they're doing something wrong, what the consequences of that will be.
And it's interesting that the agencies here are not engaging in rulemaking across the board. CFPB is doing that in the payday lending space and in other spaces, but not across the board. And I think when you use law enforcement as a tool to set policy, um, it can have unintended consequences. So in situations where there are active investigations, really pushing a fact-driven analysis is critical. And Michael, you're already involved in the last year since being out of government in those uh, the type of defense work. What are you seeing in the field? Well, I think what you want to do, if you, I mean, if you're the subject of an investigation, civil or criminal, what you want to do is work with the agency that's conducting that investigation and 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 explain why they've got it wrong. I mean, you want to point to everything that you've done in the area of. It depends on where you are in the payments chain, of course, but everything you've done to know your customer, your your your, your AML policies and programs, the things that you've got right, where you've gotten something wrong, gotten something wrong, you know, maybe just being upfront about it and saying, look, we we missed this, we wish we hadn't, we did everything we could, but this one got through, um, uh, but you know, we're we've made these changes, so hopefully we don't miss that again, and just being, but trying to educate the government agencies because nobody in the government knows this subject area as well as the people in the industry. And that's important to understand because this is very complicated stuff. And the, the government, they understand, they've got sort of a top level understanding of it. I can tell you haven't come from, from there, but there's so much more nuance and details that uh, you know, I think the industry can um, let the government know about that it might change your mind. Yeah, and I would add, add to what Mike is saying. I can tell you this from just uh, you know, the, the, the large number of enforcement cases that we do. Uh, in this area, for risk and compliance, people really have to be on their uh, on the uh, on the on their uh, up on the balls of their feet. But because decisions that are made, the decision at the underwriting stage, the decision at the monitoring stage, if you see a red flag and you fail to act, if you fail to terminate a relationship or you fail to take corrective action, simply the timing of that decision and the failure to act can result in an enforcement action. And it can come down to just decisions that are made. And so it's very possible for a, a particular merchant and a particular practice to slip through. But if you aren't paying very close attention to the actions of your customers or the actions of your merchants, um, and if you're not acting on information that you have, if you wait too long, that in and of itself may lead to an, invest, you know, an investigation which may in turn lead to an enforcement action. So timing becomes very important. And when you look at a particular customer or merchant, you have to look at cradle to grave. You have to look at the application underwriting stage. You have to look at the monitoring. And then you have to do something if you see something wrong. Uh, you know, some level of investigation is expected. Um, you can't turn a deaf ear or a blind eye to what's going on or keep your head in the sand. It's a tough thing, and it's a much more treacherous landscape today than it was, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. And, and pulling that story together, Jeff, is what we do when we're defending folks in the investigations. If we don't have those disparate but very common pieces of compliance, doing something, saying something, um, we don't have the pieces to work. Right. You've got to be able to build a defense, and that defense starts with, is the conduct itself, was something wrong done? If it was, can you explain that conduct? Can you defend it? Can you put it in the context of appropriate industry standards? One of the things we didn't mention, there's been industry guidance out there since the mid-2000s. There's no shortage of guidance issued by the federal uh, regulatory agencies, law enforcement agencies in this area. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, you know, good material out there. It's the application of that information. It really becomes all these cases, as Mike said, are fact-specific. And cases brought by the government are built around facts and action or inaction. That's right. Well, folks, uh, we're about out of time for today. Uh, but first, uh, while we'll send out information about our webinar today, and if anyone would like a copy, please uh, feel free to take a look uh, at Venable.com and uh, CFPB backslash publications will be where this uh, podcast, as well as also the slides, will be available. Um, also, for folks that uh, have asked for CLE credit, uh, we'll be sending out the survey form and uh, other information concerning that uh, later today or tomorrow. And uh, please stay tuned for the code for the CLE 
Um, and then, of, for, of course, I'd like to thank our panelists, uh, Senator Pryor, Michael, Jeff, members of our CFPB Task Force and Financial Services Enforcement Group. You've been great today. Thank you very much for participating. And our communications team, and especially Camille King, for pulling this all together. Again, for more information on the topics discussed, please visit venable.com backslash CFPB publications. And you've been listening to Understanding Federal and State AG Financial Services Enforcement Trends. Thank you for joining us today uh, or on the podcast. And now for the